Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our interview with David Assermili. David is a global model risk manager lead at SAS and driving strategic conversations with global institutions and influencing the SAS model risk management solution roadmap. He is uh, passionate about uh, translating data into actionable intelligence and uh, focuses on uh, combining the best technologies and design principles to improve modeling efficiency and quality. David, thank you for coming back to our interview today. Hello, Boris. I'm very excited to join you today. Absolutely. Thank you. We spoke with you about uh, one and a half year ago. Uh, we discussed the uh, importance of um, uh, model risk management uh, discipline, as well as some of the other current current challenges and threats. And uh, uh, because today many organizations are investing in uh, AI and ML and model ops is a kind of vital part of uh, driving returns on those investments. Uh, we would like to discuss with you a topic about importance of uh, model ops. So David, could you tell us in uh, uh, layman terms what uh, uh, model ops are and what, what is the big deal about it? Yeah, absolutely. And again, Boris, thank you again for having me. Uh, thank, uh, thank you to your audience. Uh, always enjoy, uh, you know, joining and having the conversation. So, yeah. one of the things that we have seen, uh, really, I would say, with the, within the last twelve months, is a dramatic increase in interest around model ops, right? And so, when you think about what model ops is you know the definition what it encompasses it is um it allows an organization to um really to um get your models into production in a way that's safe responsible and then manage that model throughout the usage over a period of time and there are a lot of things that can go wrong uh during that period um, and as risk professionals, you know, there is a great understanding. There's a lot of regulations that understand the damage that can be done if that model is not, you know, kind of properly uh, managed through that life cycle. So from a model ops perspective, um, organizations understand that there is a great cost to not taking care of their assets, which, which are those models. Um, and, and that is where the emphasis around model ops has come. I think the other driver is machine learning, where you know machine you know machine learning is um, an area where there's a, such a competitive advantage if you use machine learning in the right way. Um, however, it does require you to um, you know produce assets, produce produce machine learning models quickly, um, validate them. Uh, ensure that there that makes sense for the organization to use. Make sure that it's not discriminating or using data in the wrong way, and get it in production. Uh, and then once that machine learning is uh, model is in production, um, it does require a little extra care to make sure that it's being used um, used properly. And that is, I think, you know, some of the drivers that we're seeing in the model ops space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if I understand correctly, uh, first uh, maybe first period they work perfectly, uh, maybe then they have some kind of decline, and the the um, kind of role of model ops is to figure out where this decline uh, is going on and uh, stop or kind of uh, fix this model. Is it is it right to the? Yeah, no, Boris, that's exactly right. I um. The visualization I like to think of is a machine learning model is almost, you know, it's, it's like a shooting star. Okay. Uh, there is a, you know, there's a, uh, it, it's, it's brilliant. It is, uh, it's providing a lot of value to your organization, uh, but it doesn't last long. <laughs> okay. Um, and in order to kind of, you know, you know, see that star and enjoy it, you need to make sure that it's developed, validated, uh, and then moved into production uh, in, in a very short period of time. Um, there's a whole discipline around uh, ML ops in order to do that. Mm. And then, so as that model is, you know, is is providing value to your organization, it's that shooting star, 
uh, that's driving uh, profits. Um, there's an understanding that that model at any point could stop you could stop working or stop working well. Um, and and the reason that this val this model provides such value to an organization is it is uh, it's looking at many more data uh, data items, uh, data features. Uh, it may consider 500 uh, variables uh, or even more. And those additional uh, data elements that are being considered provides it with that additional predictive power to be that shining star and to drive value to your organization. However, those uh, all of those additional uh, data elements, at, at any point, they could stop uh, being useful in making the predictions that are required. So from an organization perspective, it is, you know, what I think the greatest challenge and where most organizations fail and they bring risk to their organizations by failing is not identifying when there is data drift or concept drift um, that is that shows up and then will uh, will will result in that model making poor pre predictions and, and, and ultimately will, will lose money for an organization. So. The, when you think of the model ops concept, it is a, a big part of it. Uh, and why I think it's so important in machine learning is it helps an organization um, pull value from that model when it's still viable, but then has a, a ability to replace it with a, a retrain model or a new model when, when appropriate. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, because there is a, a tool, you say you, there is a, Two di different disciplines, MLM, a model risk management, and uh, ops uh, model ops, or is it kind of a sub segment of the same discipline? Yeah, so model ops really encompasses everything. So model ops encompasses, um, you know, fr front to back the oper operationalization of your models. Um, now. One, what I focus on is model risk management and model risk is a part of that model ops, you know, discipline. Um, mm -hmm. And when you think of organizations that have a model risk policy, maybe they're required under model risk regulations or, you know, grow, growing regulations globally around model risk, uh, that model ops absolutely needs to have uh, have a model risk system as part of of that model ops the overall model ops uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So this you already explained that uh, because uh, heavy investment in AI and ML uh, uh, models, uh, they are uh, kind of it's it's not uh, very effective to just to keep them uh, running, but we have to take a, a, a kind of a measure when they are becoming uh, less effective, this model. So that's why uh, you are trying to implement this uh, model ops, right? So uh, yeah, this uh, investments, uh, so let's keep uh, investments in AI and ML more kind of uh, um, uh, uh, ROI, uh, return of investment will be higher, right? This is... Yeah, that's right. So organizations that are not able to identify when models need to be retrained um, and then do that in a very efficient way, then their AI investments often do not result in a positive ROI for an organization. So in my mind, it's the it's that uh, that clarity of how a model can bring value to your organization and how it can damage your organization that is the driver for all of the ML ops investments that we're seeing globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there, is there some example, maybe you can uh, say from, uh, without naming, naming uh, uh, throwing the names, but some examples of a system that you can, we can uh, kind of uh, associate uh, with the real life. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I honestly believe that, um, you know, there was there there has been obviously a rush uh in 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 a a business drivers to use ai in general and we've seen organizations you know like like google and amazon uh kind of come in and by using ai disrupt 
uh, a lot of different, um, you know, you know, industries, you know, businesses. So I think there is a, uh, a general appreciation for the, the competitive advantage that AI has brought uh, in, in, you know, in a number of fields. The, uh, but when you look at those organizations uh, like a Google, like an, like an Amazon, they have focused extremely, you know, had, a, had an extreme focus on the ability to, um, um, to support their models in a way in which they're gaining yeah, you know, the positivity, the positive nature of the model, and then identify when that model needs to be replaced. A lot of organizations are begin using, uh, you know, machine learning, uh, and they can you know, use these uh, these models off the shelf. A lot of a lot of uh, you know ways of using machine learning models, uh, and they have great data scientists. They understand you know how to create the models, etc. However, they don't uh, perhaps initially understand. What is required to uh, to gain value from them from a support perspective? Uh, so it's it's there's more work for a machine learning model after it gets into production. That's almost like when the hard work begins. And many organizations uh, previously uh, never had a focus or understanding for that effort and the importance of that effort. I think that's shifting now, um, where organizations again were using machine learning models. Um, did not have the proper ability to identify concept drift, data drift uh, in, a, in, a, in a fast enough way. They were actually using kind of the approaches uh, that they had used previously. So let me just uh, spend a minute on that for us. So I guess if you look at an organization that traditionally had used historically tuned models, uh, historically tuned statistical models. So they may have eight, 10 features that they're using in their model development and in, in the model itself. And those, those features are well understood there. It makes sense that they're very important to the development of that model. Uh, and then the model is moved into production after it's validated. Chances are that model is going to be useful for a long period of time. And so you don't have to do your performance monitoring you know, every, you know, you can do that maybe, you know, on, on a monthly basis, uh, in some cases, maybe even uh, on a yearly basis, it's possible for those types of models. With the machine learning model, if you use that same approach, that, that you will, that you will not understand when that model is, uh, needs to be retrained mm -hmm. and you will ultimately lose money for your organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's where I think the appreciation for model ops really has come in saying that there's a shift that has happened. One of the costs for an organization when they move to a machine learning model is this model, this model ops concept. Model ops also brings a lot of uh, discipline around kind of the, the, the um, you know, the risk function within an organization where there is an independent validation um, there is, you know, kind of constant reporting that uh, that can translate a model into kind of terms that a risk professional can understand, and then that risk professional can, uh, you know, use that information uh, to influence the overall strategy of the organization to make sure that uh, again the harm and the risks are understood, appreciated, and then mitigated. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So if we look uh, from the uh, perspective of uh, uh, regulation, so I understood if there is something uh, external changed uh, with the model, you have to kind of apply it uh, very quickly or how uh, global regulations actually changing uh, model risk management? Yeah, so so model risk management, yeah, we're seeing a lot of a lot of um, changes in the, the requirements from a, a global perspective. Um, uh, in the U.S., the the OCC published a paper uh, mid last year, and in that paper, they highlighted that it was the responsibility of the board of directors to understand to have a, a, a have a proper model risk policy, policy, and then ensure that policy is being enforced. Um, 
in in Europe. We've seen uh, a recent paper from the PRNA in which it's out for consultation today, um, but it, it it defines model risk as something that needs to be looked at across all models within an organization where previously it was a, a subset around um, you know stress testing and, and capital models. Um, there's also kind of an understanding and focus on machine learning models where you know they are in many ways they are different and require a different level of you know let's call it uh, proper care. And, and just in general, Boris, I think, you know, stepping outside of the model risk uh, regulations, we're just seeing more and more uh, focus, scrutiny, and also regulations around um, AI and data governance. And actually, both of those fit within that same, those same parameters. Mm -hmm. So, for example... If we take a life of a uh, average uh, risk manager, uh, if there is one thing that they should start uh, to prioritize now that they are not uh, kind of aware, what would mm -hmm. uh, you suggest to do? So I think the the um, the, big, the the first step, and this is usually the what a regulator would ask, is your model inventory complete and accurate? You know, kind of first first question. Um, I think the second question, where are your most important models? Okay, where are they? And for each of those models, what is the damage that they can be done um, if not if not working properly? <clears throat> Just setting the the you know understanding those concepts often from a risk from a risk perfection professional's perspective, starts the gears going within an organization that uh, that allows kind of the second step to help you know make sure that risk is mitigated uh, you know I, I've, I, I've I've always said this about the model risk function first you'd have to find out where the risk is and then you can mitigate it many organizations have yet to take that first step in identifying where those models are and what the risks associated with those those models. Uh, could be to you know the financial you know the financial well-being of the organization. Mm -hmm. Great. So, uh, looking broadly into your industry of data and uh, model ops and uh, AI ML, it's all the cutting edge. Uh, what are the major trends uh, in your space, and what uh, should we expect for, uh, should we expect from your guide in the coming few years? Yeah. So I think one of the one of the key areas, um, and, and this is a, a nice you know, tie-in where um, you know, there are some extremely well uh, versed, uh, the, the, the domain has uh, many experts in, in, in model risk. My prediction is those experts will become kind of well sought after outside of the banking area where other industries are looking to capture their best practices their expertise, their experience in managing models, uh, especially uh, and on the ML, ML side. So I think that's one trend. I think the other trend is um, traditionally in organizations <clears throat> from a risk perspective, um, you have your model risk people and then your data governance people. And they, they talk, but maybe not as much as they should. As you shift to using more and more machine learning. It's extremely vital to have the, uh, the perspective, uh, the linked perspective of the data and the models. So as an example, I often, and I've, I've mentioned earlier, in order to find out when a machine learning model st starts to fail, um, you actually don't wanna wait until the model has failed and you have data to prove the model is, 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 is working poorly. You may have already lost millions of dollars. And it actually shifts from measuring the performance of the model as a best practice to measuring how the data that is being used by the model is changing. So for example, if you've determined that a model uh, is, is very dependent on you know on 10 
10 data elements, 10 features that are being used by a machine learning model. And those 10 uh, features are changing dramatically over a period of time and, com and changing when compared with the data that was used to train that model. Then you have an early warning sign that a model is up either about to fail or is already failing and you just don't know it yet. So, you know, to, to summarize it, I think the uh, gaining a better perspective of how the connections and, and relationships and impact from a data monitoring perspective and a data governance perspective and a model risk uh, perspective and having a, you know, a, a much better understanding of how those two things are related. Um, I think that is also a big area. I think the last one that I'll just mention, and again, I think it's it's in this model ops concept. Software development, uh, you know, kind of has come up with this concept of of software that is you know updated continuously uh, through the cloud, et cetera. And a lot of those best practices are now being used in the modeling world. And, and that's kind of how model ops, uh, machine learning ops is built around some of those principles. Organizations that take advantage of that, again, will get models into productions much quicker and then being able to support them uh, over a period of time. And those are the organizations that will be successful, will, uh, will have a real competitive advantage when using models uh, and ultimately will be a winner uh, in, in, you know, in, in, in this you know, highly competitive uh, world in which data is you know, often the difference between profitability and loss. All right, I think you nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you, David, uh, for this uh, very informative interview. And um, I wish you great success in your company, SAS, uh, to further propagate this uh, ideas of uh, AI, ML, and also practical uh, implementations. And I hope uh, to catch up with you in, within in a few months uh, to, to discuss another things uh, within your domain of expertise. I would love that, Boris. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to talk with you today. Absolutely. Thank you.